Good afternoon. It's another Monday. I'm back again. And behind me, you'll see a couple of my friends. They promised to behave today. So Billy Bones just peeking over the top of the chair. And Sammy Skull down just a little lower beside my record player. In the background, you can hear Kate Smith singing some oldies. They're not quite back as far as 1930s, but they're getting back there. So remember, this is the second session on my second book, Where's the Rest of the Body? And just a brief sum up of what we talked about last time. It was a beautiful Sunday afternoon when Jay and Joel and Sylvia and Georgie went skating on the pond in a farmer's field behind Sylvia's parents' home. This is now four years later after the last story, or the first story we talked about. And it's beautiful to go skating in that afternoon. But while they were having a great time, someone noticed what might have been just a clump of brown earth showing through the ice over in the distance. But there was something there, so they decided to go investigate. Jay and Joel did. And when they approached it, they found out that it was the severed arm of a body. And of course, this led to them phoning the police and led to a constable coming out, Constable Smith coming out to see just what was going on. I think that's where we left the story last time. Now that was a Sunday afternoon, so now we're into Monday. And uh, what happened on Monday? Well, you know what happened. There'd be a big search. I'm going to read a little bit about this search in the book here. Well, actually before the search, it was just a little after half past eight. This is December the 12th, 1932. The sun was just making its appearance and Chief Petrovic was meeting with his two constables. Remember, this is 1932. They're in the Depression. Chaseford only has two constables. With the end of temperance and the onset of depression, things had become more difficult for Chief Petrovic and his two constables to manage. Finances were still very tight though. And though the chief knew Mayor Thompson was supportive of his requests for more help, he couldn't afford it. And when the chief attended the council meetings to report on the increase in crime in the small community of Chaseford, despite those reports, he still had not been permitted to add constables. So when he goes out to the farm this morning to do a search for the for the body where the severed arm was found, he's short-handed, so to speak. That's not a joke about the severed arm. So <clears throat> he's talking to his constables before the search, and he says, uh, we'll have to be careful about this. We need to tell people that we need their help to do a search. And uh, they'll have to meet us out at the Grayson home, which was next to the farm. And they're to dress warmly and be there at noon. So then he sent his two constables out to go up and down Main Street hunting for volunteers. While he went to the local newspaper to explain he said he wanted the newspaper to put out a story about the search and make a request for anyone who knew anything about a severed arm to come forward. The chief knew that it was a delicate balance between causing everyone to panic and getting help from the community. And he knew if he didn't put a story in the paper, there definitely would be panic. So he tried to make sure the story that went in the paper didn't frighten anybody too much. The search was to take place in the field behind the Grayson home on the land that was owned by Ducal Van Bergen. He owned quite a bit of land in this edge of town and they had 
no trouble getting permission to go on it, because you said nothing's happening on my land till spring. All right, ahead. Search. So Jeremiah Grayson, who lived just this side of the farm, reluctantly allowed the chief to use the empty barn about 40 feet from the house as a temporary headquarters for the search. So by lunchtime, 12, 12 noon, people had gathered in the barn and the chief was ready to tell them, give them instructions to complete the search. Now, there were a number of vehicles that appeared. Well, there's the police car. Isn't that a dandy? Well, that's the car that uh, the constables and Chief Petrovic arrived at the farm in. But by noon, there were a number of other vehicles pulled up on both sides of the road near the Grayson's house. There were Fords, more Fords, I think that's a Chevy truck, and there's a pretty nice looking car, that's maybe a Nash, okay. Very nice vehicles. They were all there. Plus, there were lots of bicycles, and there were also uh, wagons that people had driven to take part in the search. So, when Mr. Grayson, who was Sylvia's father, that's uh, she's married to Jay, who's Joel's best friend, when he looked out his window and saw all oh, this grand conglomeration of vehicles, he was a little bit disturbed by the site. But, you know, what could you expect? It was going to be a massive affair. And to be fair, the chief had telephoned Jeremiah Grayson and Clara just, be just beforehand to make certain they were aware there'd be quite a crowd there. The only person that seemed to be delighted by all the activity and everything going on outside the window was baby Brad. That's the baby from Sylvia and Jay. So the massive search started, and they searched all afternoon. Now everyone knew by word of mouth that this was a search for body parts. The search went on, and uh, by 5 o'clock, the chief of police fired his shotgun into the air twice. Bang! Bang! And that was a the sound that was to end the search. They couldn't see anymore. It was too dark. So when they arrived back at the barn, the wood stove was going full blast and there was lots of hot coffee and hot chocolate. And the searchers were glad of that. By quarter to six, all the searchers are headed back to their home. That took care of the search. And uh, unfortunately, it didn't turn up a darn thing. It didn't turn up the rest of that body, and it didn't turn up any other mystery parts. So that was a good thing. But it left the big question, how did that arm get there, and who did it belong to? Well, for a moment, we're going to go back, and we're going to talk about Joel a little bit. He... Uh, has come back to town. He spent a lot of time the last three years or so jockeying back and forth between London, where he went to the University of Western Ontario, and then he'd be back to help out in the store, his parents' store. He got his degree, but as we mentioned before, he didn't get a job. Not many people had jobs, so times were tough. And his mom hadn't been feeling too well that day, so he had had to help out in the store and hadn't taken part in the search. So, this is what we're talking about now. Supper has ended, and Joel, instead of going upstairs to that attic bedroom where he'd been struck by lightning several years previously, had to go to his new lodgings. Ah, things change. Things change because Joel's parents in order to keep the store, had to rely on Grandma. When her husband died, they sold the farm. 
just as the Depression was arriving, and with her little bit of money, that helped keep the store afloat. But part of the price here was Granny is living with them. And she's taken up one of the rooms in the house, and Joel no longer has a place there. So instead, he lives in the back part of the store. How convenient. For his parents, anyway. It's about a 15-minute walk back to the store from 200 Durham Street. And his apartment consists of one makeshift room. He has his cot and lamp in one corner of the room. And the wall, his privacy wall, is basically a pile of boxes of canned goods and other things. That, what had, that had been the storeroom at the back of, the, of their grocery store. And now it's serving a dual purpose. It's also Joel's living quarters. There's also a closet-sized bathroom in it with a toilet and a sink. How does he get in there? Well, there's a door at the back near a small landing dock where he goes in to his little one-room apartment. So he's went into his uh, into his apartment. And one other thing I want to mention is the, the heat for this, and this is part of what he does, the heat for his apartment is provided by, you remember those wonderful coal furnaces? I think if I... Oops, that's not a coal furnace. Let's try this one. Ah, there it is. One of those terrible, monstrous coal furnaces. I don't know when you grew up, but I grew up many years ago. And in the basement of our house that was dug out, my dad had put in an old coal furnace. And it looked a lot like this guy. And, of course, there was a coal bin, and shoveling coal was a fairly routine event. These monsters, though, demand to be fed especially if you want any heat. So this was part of Joel's job. He had to feed this octopus that lived under the store. So that's where he retired to. And that evening, this is Monday evening, the day of the grand search, that evening, not long after he arrived back, he had a visitor. His visitor was Jay. Jay came in to see him. And uh, he said, uh, you know, I've been thinking about things. Things are difficult in town. And uh, I think we should go and see Chief Petrovic tomorrow and volunteer our services as volunteer policemen. Wow. That was right out of the blue. It suddenly struck Joel that it was a good idea. He just might be interested in police work. So he wasn't really doing anything. He didn't have a regular job. He was helping out in the store. So he thought, okay, fine. Let's do that. So they agreed to visit the police station the next morning, that would be Tuesday morning, to tap talk to Chief Petrovic to see what he thought of the idea. Well, I guess we better forward to Tuesday. So that's what they did. So now Tuesday morning, Chief Petrovic opened the door to his office and said, Welcome in, fellas. What can I do for you guys today? Well, we've talked this over, said Jay, and we'd like to volunteer our services to you on a regular basis. We understand that you can't pay us. We're interested in pursuing careers in policing and serving in a voluntary capacity would give us some experience. And perhaps it would help us get a job at some point in time when people can pay policemen again. Chief looked at them and said, uh, you caught me off guard. said, uh, what does your dad think about this, Joel? I mean, you do help him at the store. Well, I talked to Dad, and he, he's okay with it, said uh, Joel. I'll, I'll have to help him when I can, but he's okay with it. Oh, well, said Petrovic, I appreciate this, and I'll go and talk to the mayor and see what he thinks. Because, of course, you know, in a small town at that time, the mayor was in charge of a lot of things. 
So that's was that what happened next. The uh, chief went to see the mayor. The mayor was kind of intrigued by the idea. As a matter of fact, he was delighted. I mean, he was pleased for Chief Petrovic because the chief had talked to him so many times about getting some additional help because of the uh, problems that were happening in town. So the mayor says, I think that's an excellent idea. And uh, I rec if I recall, those two young fellows all already, did they not receive some kind of uh, medallion or something for the contributions to the Carter murder investigation? Well, they had. And the mayor's memory was accurate. And he said, uh, Council and I have talked about more policemen. It'll be necessary if we're going to maintain a good level of law and order in town. We've already approved the hiring of an additional constable. Uh, but since these two young men have volunteered, I'm going to recommend we hire both of them. Now they'll have to split the salary that we were going to pay the new constable. But I'll put the names forward at the next constable meeting on Monday, Monday night. But we can only afford to pay them $10 a week. Uh, but let's give that a shot and see what happens. Well, you know, the Chief Petrovic was delighted and the mayor was kind of excited too because he knew the two young men and knew they'd do a good job. So he returned to his office in a better mood than he had for a long time. I'm talking about Petrovic. And um, he knew he could now change things. The last little while when there was a problem of some kind, Sometimes he could only send one constable, and really that was not the best way to do things. He should be sending two. Now, if, with this new additional help, he could now send two policemen. So he telephoned both Jay and Joel and said, Good news is, good news, fellas, is you are tentatively approved. The mayor says, Go right ahead, and he'll get it officially done at the next meeting. So... The mayor was pretty excited, and uh, he uh, had talked to his other two uh, constables, and uh, they were really excited, too. They were so excited to hear they were going to get some help. They were full of smiles. They're both good guys, said Constable Herman, and we need all the help we can get. Well, uh, the way we're going to work, it said the chief, uh, these fellows have no experience, so I'm going to pair Joel up with you, Constable Harmon, and I'm going to have Jay work with you, Smith. And uh, they were both in agreement. Now remember, said the chief, they're new guys, and you're going to have to help train them, teach them the right things. If these pairings don't work out, let me know and we'll change things. Well, he could tell these two fellows were so delighted to hear extra help was on the way that they were almost dancing a jig. But well, we're going to leave today's story, part of the story right there. So what happened today? Not as many exciting things as you'd hoped. But at least we now have Joel and his friend Jay in the police force. Who knows? Maybe more exciting things will happen next time. Thank you for listening.